Well, good morning if you are in San Francisco, California. Good afternoon if you're in Tallahassee or Miami, Florida, or somewhere in Virginia or New York City. Good evening if you are in Naples, uh, Naples, Italy, or Vienna. Uh, greetings to people all over the world. I hope this program finds you enjoying peace and sharing harmony through music. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. Idajo, as you know by now, is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. I'm very happy to welcome my guest today, who is Jean Kellogg. I should say about her that uh, she's a very important person in the opera world who the general public doesn't necessarily know. But people in the opera profession all know her or know of her. Uh, I know her a bit. We have communicated via email. But I know exactly who she is and what she means to the opera world. Um, what I did not know when I invited her to join me is that she was planning on retiring from her very important job, and which we're going to talk about now. So you are now a retiree, but a consultant to the San Francisco Opera, to what's known as the Merrillip Program, right? Yes. Um, I As of January 1st, I'm only working part-time, and uh, no more board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Merrillip is a separate 501c3 from San Francisco Opera, so we're not under their umbrella. We are, okay. we are an independent organization, and um, we actually hire San Francisco Opera to provide us with the artistic and produ production aspects of the program. I see. I want to try with you to explain to our international audience that may not be familiar with things like 501c3 what Merrily is, because in the opera world, if you say that someone is a Merrilino having participated in Merrilla or an Adler fellow, which is a related thing, we all know what that means to shorthand, but the general public does not know. I think we should first establish who was Gaetano Merrilla and who was Kurt Herbert Adler. Gaetano Merrilla helped found the San Francisco Opera, yes, he and did. he was from Naples. Um, he was in the golden age of Italian opera. He came to the States in, at the age of 18. He worked at the Metropolitan Opera. He moved west. He loved San Francisco. He felt that it was a fertile environment for opera. And it probably reminded him of Italy in certain ways, the agriculture, the fishery, the, the wine, and so forth. Um, he also understood that California, as the Italians would say it, was fertile land for opera and saw to it that San Francisco Opera, in effect, became the state opera company and performed often in Los Angeles, a big city that didn't have an opera company until 1984. Mm -hmm. And Merrill had brought in Kurt Herbert Adler from Vienna, I believe, in the 1940s. And Adler became an increasingly active, important person in the San Francisco Opera. And when Merrill had died while conducting a piece from Madame a Butterfly in 1953. He died while conducting. Adler then took over the company. Um, there have been many illustrious directors and heads of San Francisco Opera. I've known many of them. Um, the current one, Matthew Schilvach, is a friend, and he appeared on this show a couple of years ago. Um, but I've known the intermediate one. San Francisco has a terrific audience, one of the really best opera audiences I know anywhere, and that's a big part of life in San Francisco. Now, it created, and this is where you're going to take over, Gene, a, a young artist program, let's call it that, um, for training of people who will work in opera in the 1950s. And there's something called the Merrilla artist, young artist, and then there are the Adler Fellows. So you right. take it from there. Well, it was founded to honor Gaetano Merrilla after his death and in his memory. And it's founded by uh, Kurt Herbert Adler and Jimmy Schwabacher, who ran Merrilla for a long, long time as both president and chair of, of the organization. And the idea that they had was it was very difficult for young artists on the West Coast to get any training. It was it was back at that time, it was very difficult to travel across country. 
and they'd have to go all the way to New York or to Europe to get any training. So that was really the reason, the basis for the foundation of Merola. In the first three years, it was established in 54, 1954 as the Merola Opera Fund. And it was providing funds um, to young artists to, to do sorts of several different things um, for auditions and whatnot. And then it became its own unique nonprofit in 1957. And that's when the training portion of the program began. With about, oh, 11 or 12 young artists and a smattering of, of faculty. And they were all from the West Coast at that time. And it grew from there. Uh, I mean, right from the beginning, we've had some big names that have come through Marilla. But now we have, um, this year we'll have 30 young artists from all over the world. It is now international, it's not just the West Coast. And we have approximately 30 to 35 faculty coming in from, again, from all over the world who are the, the best of the best to train with these young artists. And it's a short 12 week period in the summer, a very intense period for these young artists who come into Marilla. Um, they basically, they have, it is the one young artist program that really focuses on training. We do have performances for them, but the crux of the program is about training. They get coachings, they get lessons, uh, they, they get everything now from, um, financial advice to life trained life life coaching um pr advice social media advice which we know is very important now and so it's it's sort of a well-rounded program to make them a well-rounded artist even yoga yeah. even yoga yes I we know. did provide them with <laughs> yoga and uh and yoga mats <laughs> and Marilla provides them with everything they come free of charge we pay for their flights their housing uh all of their training we give them a weekly stipend so they can survive in san francisco which is rather expensive um and we also provide them with attire we give them um we, um, um, we give them um, co uh, tuxes as well as dresses for the Marilla Grand Finale. Of course, we provide them with costumes for all of the other productions that we do. And we also provide them with audition attire if they need it. The one thing that separates Marilla from pretty much almost every other perform uh, young artist program is the fact that once they leave Marilla, we don't forget them. Um, they, we don't just kick the baby out with the bathwater. We uh, actually provide them with career grants for the next five years. For the first five years after they leave Marilla, they can apply up to $12,000 in career grants to help them establish their careers. Things like lessons, coachings, uh, travel to auditions, travel to competitions. We provide money for um, iPads for them. We provide for headshots, just, just basically everything that they might need to help launch their career. And it has made a huge difference to, to many of them. And, and consequently, they get to go to Europe and they win these awards because they, they are pretty spectacular. Um, just to give you an idea, we this year we had 1,350 applicants and we are taking 30 young artists. And um, they are, again, from all over the world, a very diverse group of people, very excited about the incoming class. And we also take pianists. I want to make sure we, we, we got them, uh, got known, and a stage director. So yeah. the pianists this year look really quite interesting. Um, one is a concert pianist and one is a jazz pianist. And so they, they all want to come to Maryland to learn how to be, to be trained as, as coach companists for for uh, opera singers so very excited about that and some of these pianists go on to become conductors they do we've had quite a few just in my time i've been here for 12 years and several of them are doing quite well as as conductors uh, one is running calgary opera right now as artistic director so, so what that conductors. means is that many of these conductors meet prospective singers at marilla who they might cast five years down the line, having heard a singer sing in her voice and see what her skills are at Marilla. So Absolutely. it's like creating opera DNA for these artists <laughs> that continues to get passed along. 
True. And we do bring in a lot of uh, leaders in the business every summer to hear the Marilini. We have a full two days of the what we call the a conference that that will they get to hear all of the Marilini, advise them on repertoire and advise them on where they should be going. And often they get picked up for for gigs or for uh, young artists, another you know fellowships like the Adler Fellowship, and they get heard and and hired. One of the many interesting things I find in the Merrill program, and I've worked with many Merrillini through the years, is that, as you said, it's an intensive 12-week course, whereas many young artist programs might be three years where a singer would be attached to an opera company and learn the life of a theater, occasionally do small roles, sometimes suddenly step into a big role, like singing Me, Me, um, things like that. But therefore, I'd like you, if you could, to make the distinction now between a Marilino and an Adler Fellow. Well, all Adler Fellows are Marilini. Okay. They all come from Marilla. So a select few every year are asked to join the Adler Fellowship. Um, they are chosen for, obviously, for their talent, but also for roles that they can cover or, or fill, some supporting roles that they can fill. And um, it's wonderful because then we get to see them for the next two years, or in the case of COVID, three. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we get to follow their career at San Francisco Opera. It's, it's one of the great things about coming to Marilla is that opportunity to be able to, to move on to San Francisco Opera. So it's a, so, it's a very much a cohesive uh, relationship that we have with them. So in effect, an Adler fellow is more like a traditional young artist program where a singer is attached to a company. Right. Um, and their, their focus is mainly covering roles and singing. And of course, they have master classes and they, they, they work with the leaders of the, of the program, um, of the opera center program. And, but it's not on a, an intensive program quite on the same basis as Marilla is in the summer. We're sort of a finishing school before they go off and to some of these other programs and creating, giving them the tools that they need in order to survive in this very competitive and difficult business. Until the pandemic arrived, I was in San Francisco at least once a year. I have a lot of family there. I, I know the neighborhood under the area underfoot. I don't need a map in San Francisco. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working in some form or another at San Francisco Opera many times, starting in 1993. And um, one person, one singer who was flagged for me to watch was a tenor named Pene Patti. Yes. Who I think he's in a good example, if you would pick up on this, of someone who began as a Marilino, became an Adler Fellow. I saw him step into <clears throat> roles, I believe in 2016, if I remember, um, around that time. And he's remarkable, but I think he, he's a prototype of what San Francisco does incredibly well. He is. When he came to Marilla, I think it was 2013, Penne didn't have a suit. He came from a very poor family in New Zealand, and he had this glorious gift, as does most people in his family. As you know, his brother followed him afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and... I will tell you, the first master class we had, he came out in some jeans and kind of a, a you know a loose shirt. And I had two donors come up to me and say, doesn't he have a suit? And I said, no, would you like to buy him one? And I had two of them hand me checks that right yeah. then and there. I said, thank you, because he's gonna need a tuxedo too. <laughs> <laughs> and he he was just, it, we were all just a, a gog when, when he opened his mouth to sing, it was, obviously not just this glorious voice but the heart and soul that came from his singing when he opened his mouth which is still there in spades if you, you just did elixir of love at san francisco opera and was just so charming and so wonderful and he decided he was asked to be an adler fellow right after marilla and he decided he needed to go and make money so that he could have this opera career so he his brother and his cousin started uh sole mio and they became the top 
um, crossover pop group, classical pop group in New Zealand, and they're still quite popular today. They have um, albums that are out there and they're just absolutely charming, uh, such fun to, to listen to them sing. And they were brought back to San Francisco Opera to perform as, as a group, as part of the uh, holiday program. And um, so then after he did that for a year, he made a lot of money and said, yes, I can now live in San Francisco. So he came, he came back and um, became an Adler Fellow and his then fiance Amina had just been through the Marilla program and then she became an Adler Fellow. So they they stayed here. And I, I don't know if you've been following Amina's career, but she is. Antony and Cleopatra, she stepped in. Is that correct? She did. She was absolutely brilliant. She To me, she was the star of the show, but maybe I'm prejudiced. <laughs> so a new opera by John Adams. I recently had Gerald Finley as my guest on this program. Oh, I love and Gerald. So He's he amazing. was talking about that. I love yeah. him too. And uh, because I've read it in the New York Times, I know I can say this, that the Met is bringing Antony and Cleopatra to New York in the coming season. Great. And, um, but apparently Julia Bullock was scheduled to play Cleopatra, was pregnant, and Amina stepped in. She did. And I she think did. it's an example of your you in San Francisco knowing your your talent there. And I, I say this too, because yes, there are now opera companies all over America, operas having a difficult time, but with airplanes and so on, San Francisco is not that far away. It is the Western pole along with Seattle and LA and San Diego, but with airplanes, we can get there. It's not covered wagon and railroad anymore, <laughs> but um, nonetheless, it is far. And it is. California it's being the Europe. biggest state and very yeah. populated, California is entitled to have its own bunch of singers who work on the West Coast, maybe go to Denver and Santa Fe, Seattle, Hawaii in the winter. Um, but, I mean, I think that the Merrillard program as envisioned filled, not only did it fill a void, but it created a template that really didn't exist before because um, I, when I was a teenager, was in a rather intensive summer program oh. in Chicago. And that was my foot into the Lyric Opera of Chicago when I was 16. But oh, it was my. a five-week program that led my being able to get into the Lyric Opera of Chicago. But when I meet up with friends from that year, we all talk about the fact that we learn more in five weeks than often we do in years because of the concentration. So what I want to talk to you about is how the Merrill program in its 12 weeks is able to put in so much in the minds and, and brains and hearts of these young artists in a way that a three-year program doesn't do. Because as you said, and I, I said DNA, in effect, what the Maryland program does so incredibly well, because I've seen it repeatedly, is it gives them enough that they can take it and then build on it wherever they go. Exactly. As we said, it's intense. They are working eight hours a day. They are in rehearsals. They are in coachings, lessons, um, meetings. Uh, they're, they're constantly going on a daily basis. We try to get them in the beginning, some of the take it a little slower and give them their evenings off. But then as time goes on, the rehearsals come in the evenings, it gets very, very tiring for them. But luckily they're young, so they can manage it. And um, it's it's really a quite complicated as far as scheduling is concerned to make sure that all 30 of them get enough coachings one-on-one -on -one time with, with the teachers that are there. There are obviously like three or four that fabulous faculty that are there every week of the season. We now have people um, like Howard Watkins, who comes for an entire summer, yeah. Mario Moss, Mario Morrow, uh, and and another one. And, and then we have vocal teachers who come and go um, over the course of the summer. And so it's really great for them to be able to work with those people, see them from the beginning to the end and see the progress because those coaches really get a good handle, a good grip on what their capabilities are because they're working with them one on one in a private studio. Mm -hmm. And um, also their opportunity, we, we always hire conductors and directors who are associated with a company 
so that they can see and hear who, who might be a possibility for them in the future to hire. And uh, so that's a great experience for them as well. So, and they get one-on-one -on -one with, with a lot of those uh, folks as well. What I'd like to do, because you brought up the topics, is go into sensitive areas without naming names, because that's not my goal here, but to talk about the current opera world in our current society, uh, specifically two topics. Um, I, a number of years ago, for Juilliard and then for the Martina Arroyo Foundation, and I've done Cincinnati College of Music and Colorado and other places, created a class or a seminar called Media, Social Media, and the Opera Singer, which I renamed Media, Social Media, and the Musician or the Performing Artist. Um, you and I did not grow up with social media. We did and not. And our relationship to interacting with people, and opera is a very human profession, very yeah. tactile, very emotional, very vulnerable, but also very spectacularly thrilling because of what the human person can summon and deliver. Um, whereas social media, for me, cuts two ways in that it can be a very positive thing if done correctly or an incredibly negative thing if not done correctly. I always start my class with the example of someone who's a very famous singer, and I won't name him, who when social media were new, um, would describe to colleagues and friends that if he had a cold, he had a cough, his lungs were congested, whatever. This is one of our great artists now. Um, and I wrote to him privately and I said, stop that. Because yes. you're giving the impression that you're sick, that you're vulnerable, that you're a complainer, and you are none of these things. You happen to be a wonderful man, great moral value, and so on. I love him. But he never thought of that. He was just unburdening and sharing and looking for support when he had lung congestion. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that every single thing you put on social media is there for all eternity, whether we like it or not. Exactly. And so I'm interested to know as someone who teaches this, but also specifically the Merrill of philosophy, what do you try to communicate with these artists in terms of how to use social media? to be professional, to put on the page something that, that will not embarrass them a year or five years down the line. Uh, something that, just as you said, does not make them look weak or insecure. Uh, and certainly stay away from any political statements if possible, because you never know out there who is who who might be affected by that when they're wanting to hire you if you are very leaning one way or the other too directly they're going to look at that with uh, uh, you know very very wondering how you are going to affect the others in in your production that you're going to be in and, and that's that's always something to stay away from um so yes, try to keep it professional. And also Marilla helps them with how to be professional on there, what to put up on, on their Facebook page and how to present themselves. And um, although we didn't have it at the time, I, I wanted to, to mention Rayanne Bryce Davis. She's one of my mm -hmm. very special alumni. I just heard her this weekend in San Francisco sing an incredible recital of honoring women. And during the pandemic, of course, she, like everyone else, was having a, just a horrible time, losing lots of work. She decided to go do some videos to, to share her feelings and, uh, about all the social issues that were going on related to song. And then she started posting everything about herself and what she was doing. And it's just, it's just marvelous. I mean, it really gives her a very strong image a very positive image and she doesn't overdo it with the vocal stuff online and her career has absolutely taken off it's just been amazing and but she's I'm also so very talented um well, yes but <laughs> she, she's a person of very strong opinions and i mean that in a good way but when i think of her and her social media presence it is some with strong opinions uh, not too long ago she posted something and i'm paraphrasing to the effect of 
why does everyone expect a black artist to sound like Leontine Price? Yes. Especially because she's a mezzo. Yes. And and I think there is, you know, not necessarily active prejudice, but just ignorance and stupidity where people expect that, you know, Leontine Price, magnificent artist, I was lucky to work with her, but no one else sounds like Leontine Price, frankly. Right. And no nor should you like want Maria to Hamill. sound Right, yeah. exactly. Nor should you want to. You want to sound like right. yourself. Well, I thought what she wrote about that was very educational. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it also expressed, a lot of other people expressed their opinions of it too. And yeah, you you don't want to say, oh, he sounds like Pavarotti. I heard that a lot about Penne. But Penne is Penne. And, you know, he didn't have... But I think also because Penne is a large man. Yeah. And <laughs> sometimes has a beard and people say the next Pavarotti. Whereas poor Roberto Alania, who's a wonderful singer... Came along after, right after the three tenors, Domingo Carreras, Pavarotti, mm -hmm. and the media and managers were looking for the new tenor, and they kept calling him the fourth tenor, and oh he had the burden of having to always be compared to those three guys, when he's French with an Italian background, uh, his own particular acting style and and sweetness, I would say, on the stage, is different from the other three guys a bit like Luciano a bit like Carreras but he's his own man and I always feel bad for a singer or people in any profession where they're compared to someone else who does what they do and to be given the number four yeah oh also you're right to be given. <laughs> I should have said that you are absolutely right yeah no, it's true. true it's true um yeah. this is what's so so great about Marilla is to hear these new voices come out um, and and just just be blown away by by what they can do at such an early age and it's so exciting to see where they are going or to imagine where they're going to be in a few years and some of them really take you by surprise they have light voices and when they grow up they go into Verdi or, or Wagner and you're just it's 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 so exciting it's so much fun and uh, we had a couple who came in um, early on in my, my tenure at Marilla. Neither one had ever, su ever sung Wagner in their lives. And they were cast in a role from, in, in roles from Lohengrin for the Schwabacher concert. And that was their first venture into Wagner. And now they're singing it all the time. Fabulous. They never, they never even thought about it. It's Kyle Van Schoonhoven and Sarah Cambridge, and they're now married. <laughs> okay, oh, I didn't know they were married. I knew scene. every, I knew the rest of that, but I didn't know that. Um, they met in the wedding scene in Lohengrin. <laughs> that's fabulous. I know personally because I, I trained her early on. I'm not going to say her by name, but another Marilina who's gone on to great fame, and she's a wonderful artist. Um, but certain people have and I, I think the world of her, but certain people have criticized her social media presence because they say that she's always showing herself working out at the gym or trying on a new gown and something like that. And that the, she's trying to put on a certain kind of airs. Whereas she's a very gifted, very hardworking artist who has sung in San Francisco and New York and Milan and everywhere. Um and she's terrific. And I don't necessarily, because I know her to be a nice, hardworking person, I don't see her that way. But I do hear these reactions enough to her, her social media presence yeah. that I, I'm trying to think of the nice way to tell her that what she does is a democratizing opera to some people is perceived as making it exclusive because she's very pretty, she's very fit, she has beautiful clothing. And um, how would you advise her? Well, you mentioned before that you, the, the other person um, that you saw on social media that was saying these things were, were projecting an image that they were not. Well, maybe she is those things, but say you're, you're, you're putting yourself in a box and you're making yourself unapproachable to a lot of people. And perhaps that's the way, don't you want to open up what you do and invite others to be a part of it. In the case of this particular artist, I would simply say to her, post 
a clip from your current performance in whatever theater you're in and say, we'd love to see you at New York, Paris, Milan, San Francisco, where she sings London. She's a big, big star now. And she began as a Marilina. Ah. And one day I'll tell you who that is. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other sensitivity, and I alluded it a bit with this artist, is, and I've dealt with this for quite a while when I work with young artists, um, a lot of my training was in Italy, and therefore it comes from the perspective of someone who came up in Italian opera houses. I did Chicago first, then Italy, and then came to the Met later on. And is the aesthetics of presentation. In other words, um, you said that Marilini have clothing bought for them. Um, clothing is a very personal thing in style and dress and elegance. And, you know, there are people who are not necessarily comfortable in formal clothing. It's like when you look at wedding pictures and mm -hmm. everybody is in their rented clothing. They look very stiff because they don't wear that clothing often. How do you advise? And again, I'm not going to say a name, but I know a young artist. I worked with her who's very heavy. She's supremely talented. She has a beautiful face and she's heavy. And some people discount her immediately because of her size. And when she sings, she sings like a dream and in competitions often comes in second in the competition because she's the best singer, but she's a heavy person and they don't address that. She dresses beautifully for her size and shape. Not everyone does. How in our delicate, politically correct, uh, in some ways correctly sensitive, but other ways maybe not so correctly sensitive world, can you transmit what these people need to know in a way that their feelings are not hurt and maybe have someone say that color is not great on you or those ruffles don't work or fellow your your shoulders are too stiff and you need to have the the armhole a little lower things like that that i learned in italy because italy is that way where yeah. they would say to you the armhole is wrong for you on this jacket you need to lower higher whatever how, or how to tie a tie, even those things, how to do a bow tie. Men don't necessarily know that. True. They don't wear them very often anymore. Correct. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to say that weight shaming is one of the great prejudices of our time, and especially with young artists, and it infuriates me to no end. And, uh, you know, sadly, you hear it all the time. They hear it from our donors, and it's... it's of course they know. They, you know. they don't need to hear it from you. What they need is support. And they need to be told that their voice is beautiful. It's about the voice. Opera is about the voice. Um, secondly, San Francisco Opera provides us with their costume shop um, to help with um, the design of, of clothes and for fitting the clothes for the Merle Grand Finale and for the Schwabacher concert and other things. And a lot of that comes down to foundation wear and what is going to make you look the best on stage. And what they say is, is here's what's going to look, you're going to look best on stage from a distance. This is how this is going to make you look. And I must say they always all look spectacular on mm -hmm. stage. And they, especially in opera, when you're on a huge stage and you're wearing a solid color, that's basically all we, we allow them to do is wear solid colors. Good. Yeah. Um, but that's part of it because they, they also have to sort of meld together for the ensembles as well. But it's the most flattering. And once they go through the process of this, they realize what can be what how they can be enhanced with just proper wear and to me they're all beautiful mm -hmm. they all look stunning at the end of the season when they come out there in, in their their gowns and tuxes and um and even in tuxes again large gentlemen need that support wear as, as well and and they all look they all look wonderful because they are fitted properly Proper fitting is the key. So, yeah, um, but to get them to, to go there, yes, sometimes you have to say, especially in Maryland, it's a little easier because 
you you are here we're providing you with this you are part of a group this is an ensemble thing that we're doing the Maryland grand finale so we want you to be a part of this we can't make you stand out from the rest so that's helpful in a way and in the process they learn i try when men ask me i'm not the fanciest dresser but i have good training i know about fit um mm -hmm. to give them concepts that I hope they will capture from me without my dictating to them what they're wearing. But for example, many men, even well-dressed men, I had lunch today with a friend of mine, an Italian who's visiting New York and he dresses beautifully, but the current trend in men's jackets is that they're a little shorter in the back. And therefore you see more of the backside, which to <laughs> me is not a flattering look because if the man moves his shoulders, then you don't want to, if he turns around, you don't want to see that. You want to sort of see the covering of the backside with the um, with the jacket, no matter your size, height, whatever. Um, but when the current fashion trend is shorter, then it's hard to find sometimes unless you have it custom made. The second thing is, and I, I'll give this as a suggestion, I always tell men when they're getting a tuxedo, which in Europe is called a smoking um, to get a cowl collar, not flare and not notch, because mm. those look even a little more elegant and you can wear them anywhere in the world and flare and notch go in and out of fashion. The cowl collar is always, always it works. And if a man is heavy, it lengthens his look. Mm. It, it works for almost everyone. So okay. only for tuxedos, not for other jackets, because then you look like an usher. <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with being an usher we love the ushers but <laughs> we want to make that distinction um so i i want to talk more about you because you have you did this for 12 years officially and i, and I read that you were the first executive director there were not executive directors before um i know you've worked at florida with I, now it's called wow. Florida Grand Opera, then it was Miami oh, Opera, <laughs> yeah, and the Chicago Lyric Operas, the education director. What years were those? I wonder if we overlapped at all. Uh, we did, I think, because I, I arrived. No, we didn't, because I came in January of nineteen, January first, nineteen ninety nine. We just next missed each other. Day, next day was a blizzard. <laughs> yeah, Chicago. <laughs> I showed up for work my first day and the HR director went, oh, you're here. I thought you might have <laughs> gone back to D.C. And I said, where's everybody else? He said, oh, they stayed home today. <laughs> I said, I came uh, no, I was there basically through the artist Cranick years. Right. An uh, artist died, I, I think, 97. I, so sorry, but I have to say, when I first walked into that theater for my second interview, they gave me a ticket to... Um, to go see the opera and I you know I literally gasped when I came in it was so beautiful and I felt her presence everywhere and I actually had her office it was really they did the transition they changed it around the education huh. portion of the, the fourth floor my office was artists so I felt like I was I was being handheld to the whole thing and I had but actually we meant overlap because I'm remembering I was brought back in 1994 um and maybe we spoke at that time. I was brought back because that was the 50th anniversary of the company. And yes, in uh, I, 2004, you mean? 2004, yes. Right. 1954, 2004, yes. Um, that's when I was brought back. And um, I was brought back because they asked me to write the company history. So oh, I had no. the run of the archives and I interviewed all kinds of people, board members and chorus members and fans and the legendary Danny Newman, who was a publicist, was still around. Yes. And and so I we probably overlap. Were you still there in 2004? Oh, yes. Okay. I was there from 1999 to 2008. Okay. So, I mean, it's a wonderful company. My first mentor was Artis Kranick. So, therefore, oh, my <laughs> approach to running opera companies and management is based on her. And then she's the one who helped connect me to my work in Italy. So, incredibly important yeah. in my career but artist was different because many for many reasons but many general managers 
sit in a box, they sit in sort of a hidden place. Artists, who was a large lady, would stride down the aisle of the Civic Opera House and sit in the front seat, in the front row, with the maestro to her right, often (laughs) Bruno Bartoletti, and look at the stage, and the singers could see the general manager beaming at them. (laughs) <laughs> and that was so different as a management style from any other general manager I've ever known anywhere in the world. She was amazing. And her her mantra was, take care of the artists. If you want a good production, you take care of the artists. You, and each one of them had a handler. You know, yeah. <laughs> they'd walk the dogs, they'd bring them food, they'd pick up whatever they needed. Um, they felt... Like they were, they were all felt special. They all felt like they were, had great support. And consequently, it was a wonderful place to work. It was as a staff member. I, I, I had a marvelous time there when I was there. And as a matter of fact, there are four of us who get together every year in Palm Springs. I'm going next week to meet with them, my former boss and, and mm-hmm. two colleagues. And we all worked under our, uh, my former boss. And that it was just a very, very special time. And I know that Bill Mason carried on yep. um, the legacy of, of artists. And I was felt so privileged to be a part of that. I've never worked with so many smart people in my life. It was amazing. So just so people know, the company began with Norma, with Maria Callas in 1954, uh, making her American debut and before the Met and before Dallas. Um, and... Bill Mason, they did Tosca a year or two later, was the <laughs> shepherd boy. Yes, he was. An artist was in the chorus. Oh so my God, another I notable know thing. That. Yeah. <laughs> another <laughs> notable thing about that company is that until the current head, Anthony Freud, every person who led the company sort of began, we were talking about DNA before, began in the 50s in those yeah. early productions when Carol Fox and, and two other people founded the company. It's, right. I mean, I wrote the books. I know this. It's a it's a remarkable legacy and a remarkable company. But uh, just one more thing about artists that I think is important in terms of, for example, even for today, is that artists uh, was a Christian scientist. She was mm-hmm. a very strong believer in what she believed in. I cannot pinpoint her politics. I would call her either traditional or conservative, whatever that means nowadays. But Artists very avowedly said that her values, her own personal values, were not meant to be imposed on what was being done on the stage. So that Lyric Opera Chicago under Artist Kranich presented all kinds of things. Tannhäuser, um, people who know America then may remember Jimmy Swaggart, who was a preacher who had a lot of ethical problems. And he, he cried on television, I have sinned against you, my lord. And they set, they made Tannhäuser for Jimmy Swaggart. And oh <laughs> they set the production at O'Hare Airport, not in the Wartburg in, in <laughs> Germany. And artists would not have subscribed to that personally, but she completely gave them artistic license to go with it. And she had the courage and the belief that if you hire someone, you believe in them and you give you give them your support and your belief and i love that about her it was so fascinating that she would consider that in effect it's not about me exactly. it's about the art form except when she would stride down the aisle and sit in the front row but <laughs> <laughs> but a remarkable figure so therefore you have worked in opera education um what did you do in miami Miami, well, I was, I don't know if you know Willie Anthony Waters. We are friends. Oh, yes. Sadly, he's not doing well these days. I know that. I know. Willie stole me away from Chautauqua Opera when I was working Mm -hmm. there as the assistant to the artistic director and brought me down to Miami to be his assistant. And then I became artistic administrator. So Willie hated doing anything administration wise. And that was Willie being a conductor. Yes, being Wonderful a conductor. Man, one of the first African American leaders in opera. Yeah, very talented man. Wonderful yeah. man. We had so much fun together. Um, but he trusted me implicitly and just threw everything at me administratively to take care of. And it was the greatest education I had. Mm-hmm. 
And um, I learned so much. Um, of course, he helped me along the way. He didn't just yeah. leave me high and dry. Um, but there were times when I go in, you know, they had two casts at that time, the international and the national cast. And Willie would always do the international cast and sometimes forget about the national cast. I said, um, Willie, we're opening Tosca in a week and we don't have a tenor. I said, here's three, they're available. Point. Which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's that's how I learned. It was it was really great. And uh we we had a lot of a lot of good laughs. Um we we really enjoyed each other's company, and uh, I, I I so appreciate what what he taught me during that time. Since we're going a bit down memory lane, um, in Miami, did you ever come across a woman named Judy Drucker? Of course, of course. Let's talk about Judy Drucker, who is an important musical figure Absolutely. who was certainly known in our business, but not necessarily outside, except in Florida. Well, yeah, she ran that performing arts series that was phenomenal. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and we all, I think we all performed in that leaky teepee play that, that, uh, l- large, you know, tome of a, of a, uh, of a house that we had yes. to perform in. So, which thankfully is no longer used. <laughs> she was um, a sort of impresario, impresaria she, she was. who yes. had a very strong human touch and was very strong will but not in an obnoxious way but she just knew what she wanted and she got it she presented luciano pavarotti in his first performance in america yes which is quite she spotted him and said we need him and we want him in miami first and i believe that she did a lot of consulting with miami opera as well yes she did yeah yeah and she had a long career yeah, she was still yeah. doing her doing. She was still um, the impresario at the time I was there, but um, was sort of at the end of her career doing that. And she had one of those typical Golden Girl Miami apartments that was all white with white dogs and white everything, <laughs> and you, you couldn't drink red wine or orange juice or anything. <laughs> but quite wonderful. And, and she brought people like Evelyn Lear to Florida to and Beverly Sills to teach master classes and in effect what she said was to all these new york artists it's warm in florida in the winter come on down and she, <laughs> she would look after them and it gave it lent something to the cultural life of miami and fort lauderdale that they didn't really have before yeah, exactly right and that was very very important and there are women, people but mostly women like this throughout the united states who mm-hmm. 50, 60 years ago, did this and created in Atlanta, in Dallas, I can name many cities, in Denver, certain, well, not Los Angeles, that was the exception, um, but every other place seemed to have a figure like that, Boston certainly did, mm, who yes. would bring the arts and bring culture from New York, so to speak, or in the case of artist Kranich, she would not go to New York, she'd go to Milan, and she would always mm. say, we're not you know, we don't have to deal with the Met. We want to get things from La Scala. Um, so therefore, you brought, by the time you arrived in San Francisco, quite a diverse experience as an opera person. Yes. And everyone I know who has ever worked with you, studied with you, been in your presence, has said in effect, and I'm using this word, but you can pick your own, you radiate love for the art form. This is and true. that that is the takeaway, your gifts, your knowledge, your administrative skills, absolutely. But it's that you radiate love for the art form, which is why, frankly, I wanted to have you on this program oh, well man. before I knew that you are the retired executive director of Maryland. It just means I have more time to travel and see more opera, right? Good. Okay. <laughs> so how did this love for opera that you radiate, how did this start? You grew up in Virginia? No, I grew up in no. Florida. Florida, okay. Florida. Um, We're in both Florida. My are classical musicians. We're in I, Florida. Uh, Gainesville. My father was a professor at the University, University of Florida. Florida. Okay. Mm-hmm. And my mother's best friend happened to be, they went to school in Cincinnati together, and she was a mezzo soprano. And I think the first opera I saw was Jackie singing the medium, scared the crap out of me, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I was very young, I was about five when I saw that. Um, I sort of listened to it here and there, but it wasn't until I was 
15, I think I was 15, I went to Brevard Music Camp. My father used to teach there, used to run the choirs. And so I was sent there for a summer as a pianist. That's my, that's my, my, my uh, instrument. Mm -hmm. And of course it was summertime and I really wasn't into being in a three by five room for four hours a day playing piano all the time in the middle of summer. And I discovered their opera. I went, I started sitting in on the rehearsals for Daughter of the Regiment where this young soprano from North Carolina named Carol Rolandi mm -hmm. singing the lead. I was so fascinated with her that I was sitting on every single performance and after that I was completely hooked. I go home, my mother says, what did you learn? I said, well, I learned this piece. And she said, what do you mean you learned this piece? That's all you did? I said, but mom, there was this opera and she just didn't get it. And so years later I said to her, so mom, <laughs> now that I'm in all these great opera companies, I, I hope you aren't still mad at me about Brevard. <laughs> <laughs> but the great thing about that was that when I was in Chicago, Carol Rolandi, who became John Rolandi, very famous singer, ended up running the Young Artist Program at yeah. Lyric Opera Chicago, and we worked together again. And I got to tell her and Sir Andrew that story. I said, you were the person who turned me on to opera. Sir Andrew Davis, her husband. Yes. Yeah. Sadly, she's no longer with us. Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, so where I, 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 when I was doing research about you, I kept seeing the state of Virginia in there. What is that piece? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was there. I was. It, I had two stints out in the in the D.C. area. The first one, um, I was at the Levine School of Music, which is in Washington D.C. I was living in Alexandria, Virginia at the time, and I went there when I, you know, I came from Miami, and I said, "Oh well, I need a job because I want to buy a place." And I was at the time married to a conductor, Cal Stewart Kellogg, mm -hmm. and. So I went to Levine School, became registrar. I said it was sort of a step back and said, OK, I'll stay eight months. Well, I ended up staying eight years mm -hmm. uh, at Levine School of Music. I went from registrar to assistant dean to dean to acting executive director and uh, just fell in love with the whole concept of community music schools and uh, worked with so many fantastic artists who were giving their time back to kids uh, underprivileged kids, uh, any type of kid that was there, and adults who, who lived in the area, and, and giving them lessons. And they, they really enjoyed the camaraderie with each other. <clears throat> and many of them became very close, dear friends. And it's, it's an experience that I'm so particularly fond of and proud of uh, being a part of. And uh, <clears throat> it was a, during a very interesting time because it was in the mid, mid 90s when there was this huge influx of Russian Jews coming over to the United States that barely spoke English. Phenomenal musicians. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. They would audition for us and we'd just be, do you know you have to teach five-year-olds? And they go, yes, yes, we want to. <laughs> and wow, they just completely changed the whole feeling of the school. They were yeah. very much engaged in, in what a community school was, they understood what it was, and the the successes they had with these young people was just extraordinary, extraordinary. And I felt very, again, very privileged to be there at that time with these incredible musicians coming in. So and then you said there was a second Virginia. Yes. <laughs> so from from Levine School, I went to Chicago. And then I was in Chicago for nine years. And then um, my former boss from Levine School brought me back and said, hey, I'm building this opera house in Manassas, Virginia. So he knew what was going to appeal to me. And it's part of George Mason University. Come help me build it and start it. So he hired me to be executive director there. And I moved back. And it <clears throat> took a little longer for it to be built. But of course, that's, that's the usual. Mm -hmm. and, and it was also that time I went in 2008. So there was lots of financial difficulties. Financial, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but this, if you ever go to, go to Virginia, take the time to go see the Hilton Performing Arts Center because it is, again, I'm using this word a lot, extraordinary, um, extraordinary house. The acoustics are magnificent. It's like a little mini La Scala. It's mm -hmm. got 1,100 seats. 
perfect acoustics. I remember hearing the 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 fair it was a Fairfax symphony. I was just crying because the sound was so great. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was amazing. So it it took several years to build, and um, of course it was Manassas, Virginia, and it, it was a great learning experience for me because it was the state of Virginia, the city of Manassas, and the county of Prince William that put this whole thing together and and raise the money for it. The state of Virginia, we had this fabulous senator, Senator Colgan, who could talk to anyone. He was a Democrat, but he had close friends on the Republican side. I learned a lot from that of how people actually do work together in these and make things positive, positive things happen. And um, the board at, at uh, the Hilton Performing Arts Center were all political appointees. So that was a very interesting thing. <laughs> of course, they knew nothing about being on an arts board, so that that was a large part of what my job was to train them how to be a board member on an arts organization. Please talk about that. I think that's such an important issue. Um, I another course I do is called board games, and yeah. it's about how not only to build a board, but to educate them in what's expected of them. Because I've worked with many board members in different companies, especially the Met, but not only also the Lyric Opera, in which sometimes people feel if I write a big check, then I can say whatever I want. Others feel that they have to roll up their sleeves and do constructive work. Others feel, uh, I'll say her name, Madeline Falk was the mother of Peter Falk. I don't know if you ever came across her. No. Um, her, her nickname on the Met board by other members of the board was Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> She <laughs> she imagined Peter Falk with dyed red hair, and that's what you had. <laughs> and the very similar look and sound. And, and I liked Madeline because she was very direct. Madeline loved Richard Strauss and therefore ah. would pay for productions of Electra and Rosen Cavalier and Zalame and Ariadne F. Noxos and Frau de Schott and all these operas. And she would call them my operas my mm -hmm. electra my zalame and so forth and she would weigh in with her opinions on casting and so on and she came to be known as jaws because she would express her thoughts when sometimes other board members would be willing to you know if they want to see an opera brought into the repertory say that i will like francesca dalimidi by sandra and i i will fund that but i understand that then it's up to you the met right to find the artistic team and the singers and so forth. Other board members, frankly, join boards for social status, for mm -hmm. making connections, for advancing their own business, and are not necessarily interested in the well-being of the opera company or the symphony, the museum, whatever, the hospital, the educational institution. And I've often dealt with those people who are just strivers. If they're told... $75,000 will get you access. They'll fork over the $75,000. Um, what is the ideal board and how do you build it? Well, you know, all those people are very valuable as, as a group. They can make it work uh, because they will govern each other. They mm. will. Um, I was lucky in Virginia because those people came on because they wanted this to be successful. They wanted to see a new, you know, Manassas was, is really an exurb. There's nothing out there, not much. And so they wanted to really build up um, what, what Manassas was all about and what Prince William County could do. And so they, they all were dedicated to making it happen. Some were politicians, some were business leaders. We had one singer on there. She and I became good friends. <laughs> um, but they were not, except for, none of them had actually been on a board before. So it was, they were interested in learning how to do it and what they were expected to do. And they didn't get so much into, occasionally they would get into, why don't we hire this group or that group or whatever. Um, but for the most part, they were very good. They were understanding what they needed to do. And we, we kept them busy with strategic planning and with fundraising and talking to their senators and, and their representatives to, 
to get more money from the state to make this make this a success. And it's a part of George Mason University, so it already had great great potential for success because it had that behind it. I don't think it would have survived. And one of the difficult things was getting them to understand that if we're seeing in our budget that we're going to have some difficulties, you don't solve it by throwing in more performances. That's mm-hmm. not how it works. That's a guarantee you're going to have a bigger deficit. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's what do you do to turn that tide? Um, are there other programs we can do? Uh, what kind of fundraising can we do? Who can we reach out to? Um, so a lot of it was building some education programs, in which they did. They built an education studio and they've after I left and uh, have done wonderful things with that. And I think it's really um, brought the community up greatly. There's a lot of very wealthy, well-to-do retirement communities around there who we targeted and they were gung-ho about making this happen and they and they are still involved. And um, a lot of them moved there. We asked them, why are you here? And they said, because my grandchildren, my, my kids and my grandkids are here. They're all working in the DC area. So they were used to being in large cities and having access to a lot of culture and Manassas just simply didn't have it. So they were really excited about this. And I see that there are quite a number of them are still very much involved. So, so yes, yeah, it's, it's an it's, important it's, issue that I've never on this program discussed with anyone about boards because People listening in other countries may not understand how things work in the U.S. And I'm not saying we're better or worse, but there's a different model here than you find, say, in Germany or right. England or most other countries. And I would say that our system has pluses and minuses. Of course. Germany has so much state support. It's fantastic. And they have an opera house in every city it's yeah. it's got the most opera houses of any country in the world as i understand and um you know england is now finding out what it's they're going to have to model themselves after america frankly yeah. because because of breakfast brexit they are really in 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 deep financial trouble on the arts end so it's very uh, worrisome yes. uh, england though is notable because many of its companies are connected in one way or another to the BBC, yes. the British Broadcasting Company, the Philharmonics. There's not just London-based, but there's one, a wonderful one in Manchester. Um, throughout the country and the British Isles, there are these different musical institutions. Um, I've worked a lot at the Royal Opera House. The Royal Opera House has its head, but then it has its head of opera and its head of ballet. But they report to the person above and when I worked there a lot, the man was Tony Hall, and Tony Hall was also at the BBC. And there's a lot of back and forth between these institutions, which is interesting. You would not necessarily see the head of the Met or the San Francisco Opera come from NBC or, or PBS or any of those companies. Right. It's exactly. different. Um, I'm not much into crystal balls, however, Given your very strong history and your diverse experience in different companies and sizes and departments in these different companies, and sometimes it's boards, sometimes it's education, sometimes it's getting a production on the stage. Um, I'm not going to say where will opera be. What could we in the opera profession do better than we're doing now? Well, it is changing, morphing as we speak. The pandemic and all of the social issues involved in that have really changed the dynamic of it. And some people are not happy with it. Others are very happy with it. Uh, I think it is a a lot has happened for the good uh, to change things, to move it forward. I may not be the best person at this point in my life to to make that happen. it's one of the reasons that I'm stepping back is I think it needs a, a more youthful, um, youthful person with new creative ideas. I was that person when I was in my 40s and, and 30s and 40s, and that's what we need here at Marilla. We have a fantastic 
artistic team in Carrie Ann Matheson and Marcus Bean, who really have their fingers on the pulse of opera and where it's going and what it's doing. And some of that's a little hard to, for our donors and the donors to understand that we need to go in this direction because this is what they're going to be doing for the future. It's not about putting out productions that our patrons want to see. It's about what are we doing that's going to give them the best tools to have a successful career in this business. They did a whole program of Spanish opera um, in Zarzuela one year because Marcus said, Marcus Bean used to be a, um, a manager, an agent, and he said he would get calls at who, who, who sings this stuff? Who's had experience doing this? And he'd go, ah, nobody, you know, but I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have anybody I can offer you. And so he said, there's there's an issue there because there's a lot more uh, Spanish influence opera that's going on out there now. And yeah. it's wonderful. Uh, Florencia is just fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also that of Carrie Ann's perspective, which is recitals. It's Our song is like a complete mini opera on the stage with no sets, no props, and no major orchestra to cover you up. You know, <laughs> you're out there on your own. You have to, you have to express what this piece is all about. You have to bring it across. You have to sing it beautifully, and you have to move the audience in a four or five minute time period. If you can do that, you move on to opera. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, so there is this thing about is recital a part of opera? Well, it's, there's a big part of it that should be um, because of what it does for you musically and intellectually. And I, I appreciate- Are you they, as the performer or you as an audience member or both? Oh, both, definitely yeah. both, but mostly as, as, as a musician. Merrill is a training program, first and foremost. That's, that's, that's where my, mm -hmm. um, my function is, is to make sure that we support that. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that they're handling this uh, and where we're going. And they, of course, Carrie Ann has, both of them have inordinate connections with the best of the best in the business. And so yeah. they're seeing, they're getting trained by Met coaches and, and singers from all over the, all over the world. I mean, Sherry was great, fabulous. Um, she brought in great singers, but these coaches- that Carrie Carrie, Carrie Grudewald. Sherry Greenwald. Greenwald, yeah, yeah. Yes, who I worked with uh, closely for for the first ten years. It yeah. was, was marvelous. Um, brilliant ears. The woman has amazing ears, and um, so she had a different focus, and it was ext obviously extremely powerful when you look at the people that she brought in. And Carrie Ann and Marcus are are now faced with the new, what's mm -hmm. happening in opera and where it's going. It's more modern. It's more diverse and you have to be able to shift from one, one to the other very quickly and easily and have experience in all the different areas possible. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting what you're saying about Carrie Ann Matheson, because you're, you're, you're making a connection that I felt I understood about her, but you're confirming. I met her through Marilyn Horn. Um, everybody could always say I met so-and-so Marilyn Horn. Marilyn <laughs> Horn is the big connector in, in the whole opera business. And I met Marilyn because Marilyn's birthday is January 16th. She was born 1934. She recently turned 90. And on her 60th birthday, she created something called The Song Continues, the Marilyn wow. Horn Foundation. And I was involved with that and did, I did a lot of teaching with Marilyn through the years. And my assistant at the Met, Marilyn, hired away. And, and so there's a lot of connection there. And so I was very involved with it. And on Marilyn's birthday, they did a concert the first year, January 16th. And in one of the years, I went up to Carrie Ann, who I thought was very talented. Very and I said, okay, when's your birthday? And she said, actually, it's tomorrow. It's January 17th. So <laughs> I relate them. So every year, and in fact, this year again, I always get in touch with Carrie Ann on her birthday. I think she's startled that I remember her birthday. But um, what the Marilyn Horn Foundation taught above all was the art of song and recital rather than opera. 
and Harry and through Marilyn, but also all the other teachers there learned about the potential. I remember Krista Ludwig came and all kinds of people came. Uh, Helen Donut was a wonderful teacher. And all of these people helped build the sense of creating a world in one song. Mm-hmm. And Carrie Ann absorbed all that. I watched her. And so now when you tell me that she brought this approach to the Merrill program, I'm very happy to hear that because I think that's a wise idea that she's doing. I'm glad I'm, I didn't know this. And I'm very glad that you're telling this to me. Well, she's extremely talented, extremely intelligent and uh, talk about heart and soul for singers, both she and Marcus. Amazing. They're everything they do is for these kids. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm leaving it in good hands. And yeah. of course, they came in the middle of the pandemic. I and, know. <laughs> and the whole team beforehand had left and they really didn't have any kind of guidebook. And I was it. And I never worked at San Francisco Opera, but I did yeah. know Marilyn. So, so that's why I definitely hung around to make sure that they got on the right track or at least knew what Marilyn was all about. And uh, they've been through two more or less regular seasons and uh, they're like i said they're super smart super talented and they will take it where it needs to go i just have a final question for you although i know i could ask you many things for hours and hours but <laughs> one final question for now um your career my career and the careers of many people i know represents one side of the opera profession And then there's at least one other side, namely, there are people who make a home in one place and Mm -hmm. their home life and their children and their relatives and their apartments and their whatever, they like a base. And they, and I'm not criticizing that at all. I, in effect, have been based in New York, but I've also been based in Europe until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I've always had two bases. Um, I didn't necessarily wander from house to house to house, but I kept my base in Italy and did my European work from there. I kept my base in New York and did my North American work and and Argentina from here. Um, And I like the wandering life. I just do. And I'm very happy with it. And But I fully understand when I see, for example, a singer I know and love very much, seeks to create a home where she is because she has teenage children and a husband who's not in the opera at all. And she does sing elsewhere. Certainly she's a wonderful artist, but she likes home. Uh, I've known many singers who like home Mm -hmm. and I don't fault them for that. And so let's go back to Marilyn. If you would see these young people in the nascent part of their careers You probably sense that some of them would be willing to be out on the road and loving it, while others may be looking for a life that keeps them close to one company. Um, How how do you, there's no right and wrong, it's just different, but it's, I I see both types in the opera world. And I always wonder, I live on Planet Opera, other people live in Toronto or Naples, you know what I mean? Uh Well, it's true, and I see that happening with several of the, the recent graduates, that the, it's a difficult life. It's difficult physically, emotionally, and financially. And they want a home base. Um, one I know of, two, they're Merrill alums who are married. They have two kids. Both of them have great singing careers. But he decided, you know, during the pandemic, he told me, he didn't sing during the pandemic and he didn't miss it. So now he's going into administration and I'm like, yay, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a smart person who's had all this experience on major houses in the world wants to go into arts administration. That's fantastic. And um, I'm so proud of where he's, he's starting out. I mean, he did teach for a while and that was, he really needed to be in the professional world after what he's experienced. Mm -hmm. And so I think he's finding his niche in that and and i'm very excited about that for him there are others who decide they would rather teach they'd rather be in a university um i gotta say this business is for young people this once you've done it for 10 15 years it's it's very tiring and you're just worn out just worn out and 
you're spending your life in a hotel or Airbnb and you come home, you just, you just want to be home. <laughs> and, uh, as, as exciting as the business is, as exciting as it is to be on stage, it is it is very wearing. So I'm there for those who want to go in arts admin. I'm here to advise, to talk, to, to give you some leads. And um, I love that. And I, I really, coming from a, a musical background myself and going to the arts, and I learned by doing, um, I didn't have, I did not go to through an arts management program because it was so new right after I graduated from college. And I just didn't trust it at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you that I have hired many people who have gone through these programs and I will say they are spectacular. So if you wanna go into an arts administration, get, getting a degree in arts administration, do it. Uh, they are very well, very, very well run and very well done. Um, so I would have done it had I known that, but mm -hmm. it was just, like I said, too new at the time. But, um, I think wherever your heart leads you, it's going to be impossible to leave the opera world. It's going to be impossible to leave the musical world as long as you're there in some way, shape, or form. You will be happy. <laughs> well, Jean Kellogg, because you're originally a Southerner, I'm going to use the Southern verb to conclude. It was very nice to visit with you. Oh, it was such a nice visit with you, Mr. Plotkin. <laughs> <laughs> My dear Miss Kellogg. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do hope, I mean, you, you make yourself sound super annuated. You are not in any way. You still have so much to give. And yes, um, you know, as they say in Italy, Largo e Giovani, make room for the younger people. But I also believe that, I mean, I learned from 93-year-olds when I worked at the Met, we had conductors who were literally 93. And the Met had the wisdom to keep these people around because one of them, could, Walter Tausig, could say, when Richard Strauss told me the following, you were getting the direct oracle from Richard Strauss through Walter <laughs> Tausig. And I believe that I don't believe in farming at old people, whether it's presidents of the United States, if they're good or in any profession. And that wisdom and experience have their place as much as youth and energy and that they all go together. And that, I mean, I find younger people sometimes turn to me and ask for questions and ask for information, not because I'm so wise, but I'm older. I'm not old, but I'm older. Yes. And I, I, I began working up when I was 16. So I heard Maria Callas when oh, I was a very young man, yes. when, I, when I was nine and I heard Tibaldi and I heard all these people and I worked with Birgit Nielsen and Leonie Riesenek and Leontine Price and the three tenors and, John Vickers and all these people. And I feel it's part of my job to recount what made them great and what I learned from them. And I that's think that that's what we old, you're not old. I'm not going to say that we more experienced people can bring to the, to the opera world even now. Absolutely. I'm there for whoever wants to talk about it. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, keep up the good work. Toy, 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 as we say in opera. And Jean Kellogg, I thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you, Fred, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>